Good morning, micro geniuses. This is Brian, um, and this is the first video lecture for the class that is normally scheduled for Thursday, October 5th, 2017. And I will be lecturing and finishing chapter five. Then after I'm done with chapter five, I will go through critical thinking and clinical applications for lab exercise 12. And then we'll move on to chapter six. Okay, and where we had stopped um, in lecture on Tuesday, we're talking about these different types of medically important flagella, or excuse me, protozoa. And so you see among these, we have uh, flagellated uh, parasites like Giardia and Trichomonas. Um, we have amoebas, like Entamoeba histolytica is pathogenic. We have ciliophora, which are ciliates. Um, and the majority of ciliates, this would be like paramecium, are harmless. And then we have uh, apicomplexa, which are sporozoa. And this includes some very important infections like plasmodium, which is malaria, and toxoplasma gondii, which is toxoplasmosis. And here is Giardia. And you can see that it is um, Lophotrichus, I had to think, Lophotrichus. And this is Trichomonas here. And you see that they're flagellated. Uh, this is uh, Entamoeba. Um, and notice it doesn't really have a blobby amoeba shape in this particular uh, slide, but you know it can form pseudopods and move around. And what it does is it uh, will call, cause a bowel blockage where you get um, amoebae and inflammatory cells, and that will completely block the intestines. It will cause um, uh, constipation, diarrhea, uh, the blockage will have to be removed surgically, and it's very, very difficult to fight this type of uh, protozoan parasite. So um, lots of anti-parasitic medicines will be used, and this will be um, a disease state that will persist for several months. Here's plasmodium. Uh, plasmodium is the uh, parasite in malaria, and here are the symptoms of malaria. And what you see here is just a sort of a background of white blood cells and then infected cells of plasmodium. There isn't really any free plasmodium in this slide, unfortunately, um, but there are lots of different symptoms for malaria. Here are a few of them, uh, nausea and vomiting, dry cough, fever, chills, um, enlargement of the spleen, and it can, uh, if it persists without any type of treatment like quinolone or quinine, then um, it can lead to organ failure. Okay, this is toxoplasmosis. This is uh, toxoplasma gondii. And again, uh, when a woman is pregnant, should not be handling cat poop, uh, shouldn't be touching the litter box, that's for somebody else. Uh, cats are carriers of toxoplasmosis, and so you want to avoid any contact with their poop. Okay, now um, meiosis, we should talk about a little bit. Uh, this is sort of an odd place to put meiosis, but you start out with a zygote, uh, which is two in, okay, it has two sets of chromosomes. And then it goes through one cell division. Uh, and before that cell division, you get DNA crossover. So the um, red chromosomes originally came from mom. The blue chromosomes originally came from dad. So there is DNA crossover. So you can have individual chromosomes that are essentially hybrids between mom and dad. Um, that enhance, enhances genetic variability, even without genetic crossover, when you do have uh, meiosis and then fertilization, it lends itself to a huge level of diversity. Uh, but crossing over uh, where you get hybrid chromosomes is a, a, it doesn't necessarily happen to every chromosome during replication, uh, but it is a feature where there's a blending effect that mom's traits and dad's traits are on the same chromosome. In cell division number one, you still have diploid cells because the cells have produced sister chromatids, okay? 
in cell division number two, now you have single chromosomes, so they're haploid cells, and these cells then go on to mature to become mature gametes. Okay, these are free gametes, um, both sperm and egg, and lots of uh, protozoa uh, will um, uh, will reproduce in this particular fashion. Okay. And then after two gametes are formed, they undergo a process called syngamy, which is fertilization. Uh, when two gametes come together and form a zygote, then that um, we just refer to that as syngamy. Some protozoan pathogens um, that we have not discussed before are uh, trypanosomes. Uh, Trypanosoma brucei. Uh, causes sleeping sickness, which is uh, prevalent in Africa. Uh, Trypanosoma cruzi uh, produces shea gas disease. Again, and these are um, they're, uh, they're characterized by uh, a certain level of paralysis uh, because the toxins are paralytic, and these occur through um, uh, bites with uh, blood-sucking insects, and the insects are vectors. The insects do not get the disease, but they carry the disease, so they will transmit the disease from human to human. And here is uh, one of the types of vectors, that uh, a type of uh, flying bug that transmits uh, trypanosomes. The first slide is sleeping sickness, and you see some paralysis on the eyelid. And then uh, the second is the heart and this shows damage, organ damage to the heart after um, a patient has died from shea gas disease. And you can see that all the chambers, they just basically um, look like threads uh, where the uh, parasite has just eaten away through the uh, chambers of the heart. Intabiba um, causes amoebic dysentery, or we can call this, call this amoebiasis. And this is caused primarily by Entamoeba histolytica. Um, and this is transmitted from human to human. And it's almost always associated with humans. You can get it uh, primarily through contaminated water. And it is a protozoan that forms cysts. Uh, cysts, again, are the dormant state for these parasites and trophozoites are the vegetative state. So please know the difference between a cyst and a trophozoite. And these are associated with disease. Obviously the cyst, um, under a lack of nutrition or harsh environment, then um, you get the cysts in food and water. They go through the stomach and then they get down into the intestinal tract in here and it's nice and yummy. Um, and the trophozoites are released from the cyst in these yummy portions here. I lost my arrow. Okay, there's my arrow. Uh, and the mature trophozoites then transit through the large and small intestines. And then uh, when they hit the anus, there are uh, there's less nutrition and cysts form again. This passes through the feces. The feces contaminate water, they contaminate food, and the whole cycle continues. Okay. Now, nobody likes worms. So we're going to talk about worms. Uh, there's a lot of diseases that are caused by worms. Uh, there are two types of worms. The first one is called flatworms. They're very thin, and they have a segmented body plane. And um, the first one is uh, cestodes, and cestodes is uh, characteristic of long, thin worms that look like ribbons, like tapeworms. And termitodes would include flukes, which have flat ovoid bodies. And I'll show you some pictures of this in just a minute. Uh, then in contrast to roundworms, these are elongated and they have unsegmented bodies. This would include nematodes. Uh, nematodes are associated a lot with uh, plants and uh, in legumes, uh, leguminous plants like beans, you'll see a lot of nematodes that will form in the nodules of the plant stem. Um, and, uh, but there are infective roundworms as well. And here is uh, just 
You don't need to know all these body parts. You don't need to know the physiology of a helminth, but you'll see there is a lot of physiology that is similar to humans. There's a lot of physiological features. There's a separate mouth and anus. There are male and female parts. Um, and so these become difficult to treat because their physiology is so similar to humans that if you come up with a uh, therapeutic or some type of drug or, or uh, anti helminth drug that will work against these worms, they'll also cause the same effects to the human body. So you have to be very, very careful with that. It's difficult, again, because their physiology is so similar to humans that you need to come up with some type of anti helminth drug that's not going to affect human physiology. Okay, here's a fluke. The fluke then. Um, I believe that their mouth and their anus are the same thing. And so they eat through their mouth, they digest the food, and then they excrete the waste also through their mouth. Okay, just in separate cycles. Okay, here's some flukes. They're so cute. You can see their little eyes. They can bend and wriggle and move so they have locomotion. And here is a roundworm uh, that has been taken from... Uh, I believe this is a dog. Okay, you can see the roundworm is um, uh, coming out of the intestines. Okay, and helmets um, are uh, are hatched from eggs. You know, they're very similar to humans. They have eggs. The eggs do not. Uh, the eggs dwell outside of the helminth body, unlike humans. So they have eggs larval and adult stages. And the majority of the helminths are sexually reproduced uh, in the host body. In nematodes, those are roundworms, the sexes are different with unique gender features. In trematodes, the sexes can be separate or they can uh, be hermaphroditic. Hermaphroditic means that the same individual has both male and female parts. And then cestodes are generally uh, hermaphroditic. Remember, trematodes and cestro cestodes are flatworms. Okay. And so, in this particular instance, um, the egg and larva can be transmitted to the same host, can be reinfected, or they can be infected to a different host. Okay. The larval development occurs in the intermediate host, and the intermediate host can or cannot, you know, may experience symptoms at this point or may not. And then adulthood and mating occur in the definitive or the final host. And these hosts, the intermediate and final host, it can be the same person that is basically just cultivating these worms throughout their life cycle, or they can be transmitted from person to person where you have a different intermediate host that is developing the larva, and then the final host is de uh, developing the adult and then holding a little sex party so they can mate. Okay, so they can be the same or different. Um, there is a vector, and it can be a vector. Usually this vector is a physical vector. It's not, you know, something that ingests it, but the vector is, um, is the intermediate host that suffers no ill effects. When a vector, by definition, carries around the pathogen, but it doesn't suffer any ill effects, okay? And interestingly enough, the mating cycle for helmets is lunar. And so you hear all this um, business about people going a little wacko during the full moon. It could be that in their intestinal tract, um, they're hosting a little sex party during a full moon because these helmets come out, they borrow into the intestinal wall and they come out of the intestinal wall for mating. And this happens around the same time that there's a full moon. Don't ask me why. I don't know why these uh, helmets know that there's a full moon, but it is a lunar cycle. Okay. Now, pinworms is interesting and it's indigenous to California. It's more indigenous to Southern California because of the climate, but Almost every school child gets pinworms at least once in their lifetime. And so here's a physiology of a pinworm. Okay. And a pinworm is a is more of a flat worm. It's not round. Okay. And here's the perianal region, and you see these little white things or pinworms in um, in that particular region. Usually the way that pinworms are diagnosed is you just take a piece of scotch tape and then you um, just 
uh, adhere the tape to the perianal region, rip it off, and you'll get some worms on the tape. And you show the worms to the doctor, and the doctor says, oh, yes, you have pinworms. And so here's an um, individual who ingests some embryonic eggs, okay, digging in his bottom, uh, no hand washing, goes from uh, anal to oral, um, larva are hashed, hashed in the intestines, they penetrate the uh, intestinal mucosa, and when they penetrate the intestinal mucosa, they encounter all these polysaccharides and proteins that are super yummy, and they mature in the small intestines, in the upper colon, uh, they mate in the colon in small intestines, and then pregnant worms, pregnant, this says gravid worms, gravid is just the same thing as pregnant, they migrate to the rectum, and then they lay their eggs in the perianal region, and there are some gravid worms, and they are just laying their eggs there, okay. And there are about 50 parasitic helminth species known uh, to infect humans. Uh, helminths uh, do not survive well in cold environments, so you see them in tropical regions. And they co-migrate with human hosts, so if somebody has a, an infection of pinworms and they go into a colder region, then they can co-migrate. Can, you can have an outbreak in a colder region uh, because the human hosts are carrying them and are acting as like pseudo-vectors as they migrate. Okay, there's about 50 million helminth infections per year, which is about one-sixth of the population. And the primary target is malnourished, uh, mal malnourished children. And so malnourished children are also immunocompromised because when you have a poor diet, then your immune system suffer suffers. And so they have a harder time fighting off these infections. Okay. So let's review. So two types of fungi, we went over these and the two types of fungi are molds and yeast, two types of protists, remember protists and fungi are uh, kingdoms in the domain eukarya, and so the two different types of protists would be the two subkingdoms, algae and protozoa. Um, what do algae have that protozoa don't? Algae have chloroplasts. Okay, algae are photosynthetic, they're phototrophic, and protozoa are heterotrophic. Phototrophic means that the algae can make their own organic carbon, and heterotrophic means that the protozoa have to get their uh, organic carbon from other sources. What is a cyst? And this is in terms of microbiology. And you'll remember that there are two states of specific protozoa. Not all protozoa do this, but there are two states. One is called the trophozoite, and the trophozoite is an active vegetative form of the protozoan. And a cyst is the dormant form of the protozoan. Amoebas will form cysts. And when amoebic cysts get into the water supply, then specific species of amoeba can cause uh, diarrheal disease. Okay, but the cysts are dormant under harsh conditions, low nutrition, low water, and the trophozoites are vegetative. Once the cyst is rehydrated and introduced into an environment with nutrition, then it becomes a trophozoite. The definitive or final host for helminth, that final host is where the helminth actually um, allows, it becomes an adult, so it allows for the maturation of the helminth to adulthood, and the definitive host is where mating occurs. And so after mating occurs, the pregnant helminths then migrate to the perianal region, and that's where they lay their eggs. Okay, and so look at that. We finished chapter five, so we're done with um, eukaryotic cells. Not completely done. Uh, we're going to review this over and over again. Let's see, we have one, two pages of glossary, so make sure that you look over the review slides and the glossary. Okay.
Next, I will discuss critical thinking and clinical applications for exercise 12. So this is on page 106 of your lab textbook, okay, exercise 12. In critical thinking, what ingredient makes mannitol salt selected? Okay, well, first of all, let's look at the two ingredients that are listed here. These are pretty key. Mannitol is just a sugar. And so I don't think, you know, most, most microorganisms, most bacteria can metabolize mannitol just the way that they would metabolize glucose. So I don't think it's selective. So that leaves salt. And uh, highly, uh, you know, a, a high concentration of salt is indeed selective. It selects out for um, organisms that have, would have a thicker cell wall because they can handle better the osmotic stress that would be associated with a salty environment. And if you think of the different bacteria that are cultivated on your skin, like Staphylococcus aureus and Staphylococcus epidermidis, your skin does secrete salt and you know, along with oils and along with water and sweat, you do have salty skin. And so this would select out specifically for gram-positive bacteria. Okay. And then for number two, um, you should be able to fill in the blanks on your own. And you should also note which bacteria are gram-positive and which bacteria are gram-negative. Okay. And so... Make sure that you either circle them and put a plus sign next to them or a negative sign or do something that when you filled in these four blanks that I know which ones are gram positive and which ones are gram negative. Okay, then the clinical applications. Um, skip. These are... Uh, uh, they're really hard to answer. I uh, just skip them all. Skip them. Skip like the wind. Uh, I don't really think that it's necessary that you look these up. What you're going to find is that antibiotics are selective, and they will select out different bacteria that are antibiotic resistant, and they will not allow the growth of those that are susceptible to antibiotics. And so that's what you're seeing. Uh, is And as long as you know the difference between selective and differential media in this particular exercise, then I think that you've learned a lot. And I do want you to remember that you saw instances of selection as well as differentiation. In mannitol salts uh, media, the salt was selective for only gram-positive organisms. And the mannitol was differential because certain bacteria, namely Staphylococcus aureus, would ferment mannitol and turn the media yellow. Everybody saw that. So you have a selective aspect of mannitol salts auger, and you have a differential aspect of mannitol salts auger. EMB auger would only select for gram negative bacteria. Okay, so it was selective. But you also saw that an EMB auger, if you grew E. coli, that E. coli would grow with a metallic green sheen. Okay, so it was also differential because you could differentiate in this case from E. coli and any other gram negative species of bacteria that happen to grow an EMB auger. So um, when you're asking which media are selective, both are and which media are differential, both are. They both have aspects that cause them to select out bacteria and to differentiate between the, the colonies of bacteria that end up growing on each of the media. So anyhow, I hope that is very helpful to you. We'll now move on to chapter six. And chapter six is all about viruses. 
Now, viruses are very different. We don't refer to viruses as being alive or dead. We refer to them as being active or inactive. As ter in terms of life, viruses stand out among the other forms of microorganisms because they're, the type of life that they have is very different. Uh, they're by and large parasitic, pathogenic, or parasitic because they require a host. So they have to have a host cell in order to survive. Their physiology is very similar on their own. When they're non-infective, they lay in a dormant state. Uh, after a while, they will inactivate in that dormant state. But if they are picked up by a host, then they can be reactivated and they can hijack the host machinery in order to propagate the virus. So our objectives here are to understand how viruses fit in on the biological spectrum, uh, their non-cellular life, we don't call them prokaryotic or eukaryotic because they don't have cells, but we need to understand how they fit in biologically. Uh, we want to look specifically at virus structure. Virus structure is much more simple than what you would find even a prokaryotic cell. And we'll talk about the classes and names of the different viruses, understand how they multiply, and understand virus culture, and even talk about medically important viruses. There's obviously a lot of viral diseases. Some are rather insidious. Influenza is a virus. Um, a lot of the, uh, what we would call quote unquote childhood diseases are viral. Um, hepatitis is viral. And so there is a really, really strong interest in being able to both prevent viral disease as well as treat viral disease. Okay, uh, are viruses alive or dead? Okay, we usually refer to them as infectious particles and not living entities. And rather than saying it's alive, then we'll say it's active. And rather than saying it's dead, we'll say that it's inactive, okay? And interestingly enough, we're finding out as scientists that the human genome is a very, very fluid. And the genome is all the genes, all the chromosomes, everything that is in the human body. And scientists think that up to 90% of the human genome actually integrated into our genome from viruses. So viruses play an important role in terms of donating their DNA to other organisms and allowing that DNA to be incorporated into other organisms to confer different traits. Okay, so this is just a table from your book. They're obligate intracellular parasites. Okay, they're parasitic. Uh, viruses infect everything. There are even viruses that infect bacteria. Um, they are everywhere. They're ubiquitous in nature. Ubiquitous just means that they're extremely prevalent and they have a major impact on human life and all biological life. They're very, very small. Uh, some viruses are down to 20 nanometers. Um, the largest virus perhaps is a smallpox virus, which is about 450 nanometers in diameter. You can almost see it with a light microscope. They are not cells. They do not have a cellular structure. They do not have a plasma membrane. And um, they do not independently fulfill the characteristics of life. You can't just culture viruses and have them replicate without a host cell, okay? And so they're active inside host cells and they're inactive, inactive outside of the host cell. And their basic structure consists of a protein, which we call a capsid, and the capsid is the outer portion, and that surrounds a nucleic acid core. Nucleic acids can be either DNA or RNA, but we do not have both in the same species. DNA can be double or single-stranded. RNA can be double or single-stranded. And um, these viruses, the, the molecules on the surface of viruses, which are called spikes, um, are very specific to the cells that they infect, okay? So they can um, look at a host cell, like a human cell, 
look at the proteins on the host cell, and they can attach directly on that particular host. Okay, the virus, if it's human infective, is not going to get confused and attached to bacteria. Um, you have high specificity, and so that virus uh, has adapted to be able to very specifically find its host. Okay, they multiply by hijacking the cell's genetic material and regulating the assembly and synthesis of new viruses. What they do is they simply use the cell's RNA polymerase in order to transcribe genes. And then once the genes are transcribed, the viral genes uh, as messenger RNA are translated by the host cell's ribosomes to make the virus proteins. Once the virus proteins are then synthesized, then they self-assemble to make new viruses, okay? Uh, they do not um, accomplish most metabolic processes, and they lack the machinery for synthesizing proteins. So they can't synthesize their own proteins. They can't synthesize proteins unless they've hijacked a host cell. Okay, so let's break down the viral components. First, you have some type of covering, and then you have a central core. And the outermost covering is made out of protein. It's called a capsid, and you'll find a capsid in all viruses. And then inside the capsid, you will find, I'm sorry, outside of the capsid, you will find an envelope. So I'm, I screwed up, sorry. Capsid is in the inside. The envelope is in the outside, and the envelope is not found in all viruses. There are envelope viruses, and then there are naked viruses, okay? And then the capsid and envelope protect the central core, which has nucleic acids, and can be a DNA virus, can be an RNA virus. And then the central core also has matrix proteins and some enzymes that are sometimes found in viruses. The matrix proteins function just to uh, provide structure to the nucleic acids, and the enzymes may provide some type of metabolic function, but they tend to be rare in viruses. Okay, so you can have an envelope virus, that's B, that has a covering, just a phospholipid bilayer, and then you can have a naked uh, virus, and the naked virus just has a capsid, in it, and the capsid is kind of a polygon shape, and the polygon shape is protecting the nucleic acid inside. At the apex of every one of these capsid portions, you find a spike, and these spikes are glycoproteins. They contain sugar and protein, and they're highly specific for attachment to the host cell. You find spikes on the envelope as well in envelope viruses and the capsid does not have any spikes. Okay, so the capsid is made out of protein components called capsomers, and these are just subunits, usually a single protein, and the subunits self-assemble to make a, thing, a finished capsid. And you can have a helical capsid, a helical capsid looks more like a cone when you actually look at the virus, but inside the DNA is making a helix. And then you also can have a big polygon that looks like it approximates a sphere, and that is icosahedral. Uh, helical capsids, like I said, form a continuous helix, and the nucleic acid is coiled in the helix. Uh, helical capsules, this would be like tobacco mosaic virus, which kills tobacco, uh, influenza, measles, 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 and rabies. Okay. So a helical capsid looks like this, and the capsomers are those small things that look like um, capsules that you would take, like a Dristan capsule, it looks like medicine. Um, and then as the capsomers assemble, then they will protect the nucleic acid in the inside, and the capsomer, the capsomer will then develop a full capsid that protects the entire nucleic acid. Here's an envelope virus and you see that there is a capsid on the inside that's protecting the helical structure of the DNA, and then an envelope on the outside, okay? There's a helical virus, and the helical virus is just a capsid, it's just a capsid made out of capsomers. The envelope virus 
has a helix in it, and the helical virus obviously does not have an envelope, but it is forming a helical structure that just basically looks like a cylinder. And so these envelope viruses here, you can see kind of a little helix inside of each one of these envelopes, but the predominant feature is the envelope, which is more of a blob, it's a little more circular. And then these helical capsids, then they just look like cylinders, look like little grains of rice, but they're actually helic helices that have been formed and the outer structure just uh, approximates a cylinder. Icosahedral capsids, uh, this is a 20-sided figure, and the 20-sided figure has 12 even-spaced corners. And you can have a single type of capsimer. This would be 20 capsimers, or you can have different types of capsimers. You can have a variety in the same virus. And the capsid will appear spherical. Some of them appear cubical. Here's um, an icosahedral virus with no envelope, okay, and you can see that. And here's one that, this is just a, uh, a protein diagram. It's not an actual picture of the virus, but it shows that it approximates a spherical shape. So we have helical capsids, we have icosahedral capsids, and then we can have what are called complex capsids. Complex capsids have multiple types of proteins and they have asymmetrical shapes. Okay, so this is the third type, sort of a catch-all type, where we can't, if a capsid doesn't look icosahedral or helical, then we just throw it into this complex category. Okay, okay this is an interesting um, virus. It's called a bacteriophage. Phage is just another word for virus. Bacteriophage implies that it infects bacteria. And it has an icosahedral head. Okay, that's where the DNA is contained. But here then it has a neat delivery mechanism. So these heads will actually then uh, hang off of the end of the virus and these tail fibers in this base plate will uh, adhere to the surface of the bacteria. And then the sheath allows for injection of the viral DNA directly into the bacteria. Okay. So, and I'll show you a picture of this. This is kind of a cool process. Uh, the icosahedral head never actually makes it into the bacterial cell. It doesn't need to, uh, but the rest of the virus acts like a delivery system and it just simply injects the DNA into the bacterial host cell where more viruses can be formed. Okay, uh, like I said, all viruses have capsids, but not all viruses have envelopes, okay? In this case, the virus actually takes some of the membrane. This could be the cellular membrane, or it could be a membrane from one of the organelles uh, from a host cell. Okay, it comes, uh, and these envelopes are generally envelope viruses infect animal cells. And then the virus, after it hijacks the membrane, actually takes the host cell's membrane, then it will. Um, sort of eject the membrane proteins from the host and replace it with its own membrane uh, proteins. And so the viral envelope will be covered with these sort of protein spikes that are indigenous to the virus where the membrane itself was indigenous to the host cell. Okay, these proteins are called spikes and they're glycoproteins. That means that they're part glucose or part sugar and part protein. And they protrude out from the envelope and they allow the virus to attach directly to the host cell. Okay. And envelope viruses are pliomorphic. That means that they're shape shifters. And so the envelope can take on different shapes depending on the application. It can move around. Um, it can move to accommodate injection of the uh, of the viral DNA into the host cell, okay? And you'll see that envelope viruses can have helical capsids, or envelope viruses can have icosahedral capsids, okay? And it has different glycoprotein spikes, okay? Here's an example of a, a virus with a helical capsid, and you can see the glycoprotein spikes here, 
And then here's some envelope viruses with uh, polyhedral capsids. And if you look at the outer covering of the, of the uh, virus, its primary um, purpose is to protect nucleic acid. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this functions when the virus is outside of the host cell. And so you want, uh, if you're a virus, to be able to protect, uh, be protected during harsh environments. And so you see these uh, capsids and envelopes in enteric viruses because the virus has to survive the stomach, it has to survive the duodenum and the intestines. And so these viruses are uh, protease resistant. They um, are very, very tough and they'll survive the digestive system until they actually find in the lower portion of the intestines and the colon a place to infect. Okay. Uh, the other function of the capsid envelope is to be able to bind the cell surface, uh, the host cell surface, with special binding proteins. These are uh, the glycoprotein spikes will bind directly to the receptor proteins of the host cell. Okay. And then they'll assist in the penetration of the host cell and allow the viral nucleic acids to actually go into the cytoplasm of the host cell. And the coat proteins can also stimulate the immune system. The immune system, obviously, when you're infected with a virus, is going to be alerted. And so the coat proteins are antigenic. They do not look like human cells. And so that's going to alert the immune system. And then by stimulating the immune system, the body can mount an immune attack against the virus. At the inside of the virus, we have nucleic acids. Viruses are either DNA viruses or RNA viruses, but they're not both. Both encode genes, and so both are highly appropriate. You don't necessarily need DNA if you have messenger RNA, and so therefore these viruses have adapted to only have ribonucleic acid rather than deoxyribonucleic acid. Uh, if you look at the virus genome, the number of genes is quite small. Uh, for hepatitis B, there's only four genes, so with four proteins that can survive. Uh, herpes virus is much more complex. It has multiple genes. And then if we have single-stranded DNA, those are called parboviruses. Double-stranded RNA is called a reovirus. And these are important terms to remember. Single-stranded RNA are um, ready to translate into protein. So single-stranded RNA that are positive sense, the ribosome of the host cell can just attach to that positive sense RNA and it can start to make the viral proteins. Okay. Negative sense RNA has to be converted to positive sense RNA by the host cell, uh, like an RNA polymerase or uh, a reverse transcriptase or something like that will translate the RNA into positive sense RNA and then it can be converted into protein. Okay. And here are a lot of different classes of viruses. Uh, these are relevant to DNA only. Okay. And um, I'll tell you in these, there's a lot of terminology and you don't need to know all of these. Um, you should know the different classifications, you enveloped or non-enveloped, and under-enveloped viruses, you only have double-stranded DNA. In non-enveloped viruses, you have both double-stranded and single-stranded DNA, okay? And namely, uh, it gets a little tough because like single-stranded genomes are all called parboviruses, but then double-stranded genomes, you have adenoviruses are linear, and uh, Papova viruses are circular. And then if it's a double-stranded genome uh, in an envelope virus, a pox virus is helical uh, capsid and a herpes virus has a, an icosahedral capsid. So 
out of this, I would want you to know the broad classes, and I will be very, very specific on the review sheet as to which viruses you should know, which are the most important. I would certainly know parvovirus and reovirus at this particular point in time. Okay. RNA viruses, it becomes much more complex. There's non-enveloped and enveloped RNA viruses. If you look at the non-enveloped, there are double-stranded double genomes called rheoviruses. There are single-stranded uh, genomes that are uh, picornaviruses and uh, calicea viruses. And then in RNA viruses, enveloped uh, viruses are all single-stranded genomes. Hmm. And in the envelopes, you have a specific type of virus. You should know this type of virus, circle it. It's called a retrovirus. And this single-stranded genome uh, that encodes reverse transcriptase, this retrovirus, it actually can make DNA from its RNA because it encodes reverse transcriptase, and the DNA can integrate into the host genome. This is medically relevant because it includes HIV. HIV is a retrovirus. It can, HIV virus can integrate into the human genome. It can be carried forever. In terms of single-stranded genomes without reverse transcriptase, you have segmented and non-segmented genomes. And you don't need to know these different classes of segmented and non-segmented genomes. So, you know, I would know what a real virus is. I would know what a retrovirus is. And I would know the different classifications. Okay. In viruses, there are three orders. There are 73 families. And there are 287 genera. Okay. And so the orders are cotovirales, uh, mononegavirales, nidovirales, and you should know um, the, the different hosts that are associated with these different orders. Cotovirales are bacterium, so these are bacteriophage. Mononegavirales and nidovirales include plant and human uh, variants. Um, mononegavirales includes measles and Ebola, and nidovirales includes rubella. And so these are medically important uh, viruses, so I would know those, okay? And usually we don't, we don't use um, binomial nomenclature for viruses. Usually instead we just use uh, either the genus or the common name, or the genus for measles is morbilla, Genus for Ebola is Ebola virus. The genus for rubella is rubavirus. And so I would know, you know, for these common virus species, I would know their genus as well. And at this point, I am going to conclude the first lecture. We're at 48 minutes. I apologize. I went three minutes over. So the next lecture will be a little shorter. So this concludes video or, um, uh, yeah, video, I guess, lecture number one.